Hey, thank you. It's great to be here, and thank you very much for your welcome. And it's particularly, it's great to be here today uh, on the day that you're thinking and talking a little bit about Focus. And I, as Sam and uh, my wife and I, we, we would love to um, see you at Focus this summer. We we would encourage you to do everything you can to make it possible uh, to be there. I think it's going to be an extraordinary uh, few days together. Uh, so if you can possibly find your way there, uh, please do. And what I want to do tonight for a few moments is to talk about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And in particular, to kind of ask a question, really, whether there's anything that you and I can, practically speaking, do that would... Uh, open our lives up to more of the flow of the power of the Spirit through us. In other words, is there a way that we can set ourselves up, position the way that we do our lives, what should we say, this summer, between like, well, between now and focus, the next couple of months? Is there anything that you and I can choose to do that would therefore create more of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit through our lives. That's what I want to look at. And we're going to look at uh, the beginning of Acts, a um, book in the New Testament. And this story is right in between the resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring, the coming of the Holy Spirit that we celebrate at Pentecost. And I'm going to read a little bit from Acts chapter 1 and a couple of other passages. It says, Then they gathered, that's the disciples gathered around Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. A little bit later, it says, The apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And those present were Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And then a little bit later, finally, it says, beginning of Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I think it's amazing how things can go viral. You know, someone can upload a social media post or a silly video or something, and for whatever reason it can sort of spread and be taken all over the world sometimes. Millions of people can see it. I mean, it's made... Going viral has made stars of Billie Eilish and hits of um, Old Town Road. Uh, I've never gone viral myself. Uh, I once had a, a little video that was seen just under 500 times. But, but I am part of... I have gone viral in a sense because I'm attached by faith in Jesus Christ to a movement that's gone viral. God has gone viral. And the book of Acts, what we've just read, is really the story of how God goes viral. There's something happens at the book of Acts that causes an explosion of growth, an expansion of God's kingdom through cities and nations and whole areas, life change and transformation in communities. And that's something that happens that goes, causes the thing to go viral, is the coming of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Acts is about that, but Acts is also about another story. It's about the story of a group of people, followers of Jesus Christ, like, like you and me, who choose to come together. And so oftentimes, like we've just read, it says that when they met together, when they joined together constantly in prayer, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. And these two stories... The story of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and God going viral and the story of God's people choosing to not do the life on their own but to attach themselves to one another, to be together. The two stories are not unconnected. In fact, I believe that it is because the people of God chose to be together that the precipitation of the power of the Spirit was possible. And so... Did you know that every time that you make it along to the seven, every time you get along to connect group or 
to saying hello to the person next to you. When you do those things, you're not actually just creating community or contributing to the Lonely Hearts Club of London. But you are providing an environment for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in power. And something extraordinary happens when we get together. If you've ever questioned, will I be missed? Or will I miss it if I don't make it to church this week? Or if I don't get along to Connect Group or to Focus or to Kingdom Come? Then this message is for you. If you've ever wondered, how can I have more of the Holy Spirit flowing through my life? This is for you. If you've ever asked, is there something that I could do with my little single unit of a life that if I attached it to something bigger and greater than me would somehow cause a move of God that is beyond what I currently experience and dream of? Then this is for you. Because something extraordinary happens when we get together, when we choose to take our lives and attach our lives to God and to God's people, which of course is a, a challenge for some of us as well. Maybe like me, because if your issue, like I think sometimes mine is, is self-containment or self-reliance or I'm all right on my own, thank you. Then, uh, I mean, sometimes people ask me, uh, are you an introvert or an extrovert, Archie? The answer I normally give is I'm a social introvert, which basically means that I like being with people, but on my own terms. If I've been in this story and I've been returning to Jerusalem, it says, after a Sabbath day walk with everybody else, I probably wouldn't have gone upstairs to join them all in the upper room, not right away anyway. I just said, I just need a little bit of me time. I'm just going to take a shower, read my book. I'll be up in a bit. But look, if you're up tonight for this challenge of it's better together, then there's three things that I think I and you can choose to do. There's a way of setting up or positioning the way that you behave, you operate. You can make this choice to do these three things, I believe. Uh, and if you do, and if I do, then we will significantly enhance the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through us and the impact of God in our lives. And the first thing is this, connect and don't disconnect. I think stories of connection are, are so powerful. I, I came across this one just recently, last month, the story of Ellen Macken, who's 81 years old. And last month, she met her mother, for the very first time. Her mother is 104 years old. And uh, Ellen Macken, who's 81, she was brought up in as, as an orphan in Dublin. And since the age of 19, so for over 60 years, she's been searching for her mother. And after an appeal on Irish radio at the beginning of this year, she was found, her mother living, who's moved in, living in Glasgow. And last month, they came together, they got together for the first time. And Ellen Macken said that actually she wasn't sure whether her mother fully understood the connection between them. I mean, she's 104 after all. But she says, she never let go of my hand. Something powerful about connection. Maybe why on an everyday level, so many of us appreciate good customer service. Yeah, I know, the barber that I've started to go to in Brighton, thank you. Uh, I, I've started to go to, thank you, partly because it offers its guests and customers a free cold beer. I mean, their customer service is so good, I tell you, that they even offer my son a cold beer. He's 14. <laughs> How good or, or otherwise are you at connecting? If you look closely, leading up to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the start of Acts, there's nothing that these followers of Jesus do by themselves on their own. You don't ever hear them say, I only pray on my own. I prefer to eat alone. I do my own thing in my own way. And why does Luke here, who writes the story, why does he go to such great lengths to list by name all the people who were together in the upper room on that occasion? I mean, there's 
Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James and Simon, he says, and Judas, son of James, and the women, and Mary, and Jesus' brothers. I mean, spare us the roll call. Can we get on with the story? No, actually, because he wants to name check every single one of them. Because this isn't a group of randoms. It's a group of named individuals who have chosen at a certain time and a certain place to come together. And their choice of being together has led or will lead to the impact and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in them and on them and through them. And Luke wants it to be known and recorded throughout history who was there on that occasion. Connect and don't disconnect. Don't pull away. In the church that we're in in Brighton over a number of years now, amongst other things, has run two courses. Uh, one is called Overcoming Anxiety, and the other is Dealing with Depression. And at the beginning of this year, someone, I don't know who had the idea that we should change the name of those two courses. And so now, instead of calling them Overcoming Anxiety and Dealing with Depression, they're called Tackling Anxiety Together and tackling depression together. And it may be completely coincidental, but since we made that name switch, the number of people accessing those two courses has doubled. And the average age of people coming on them has halved. And the number of people coming to them from outside the church has shot up. Because there's something powerful by when we connect together. Connect. And be a connector. There's someone, again, in St. Peter's, the church where we are in Brighton, and I remember the very first time she came on a Sunday to a service, she came carrying a suitcase, and she sat next to a couple of members of our church who'd been in the church for some years, and they got talking, and they asked her, why have you got your suitcase with you? And she said, well, actually, I've just moved to Brighton from the Netherlands. This is the first time I've come here. And she said, I've got a job in Brighton, but my family, my husband and my two young children, they're back home in the Netherlands, and they'll join me, hopefully, when we found somewhere to live and uh, somewhere for the children to go to school. So in the meantime, I'm staying in a series of hostels, different hostels in the city. And this couple, they said to her, you don't want to stay in hostels in Brighton. Come and live with us. So within half an hour of her walking into the church, it had gone from an invitation to a Sunday lunch to a home for her to live in. And when a few months later, her husband and two young children joined her, they already had a, a family that they could connect in with. You can be a connector and connect anywhere you go. I mean, think of that this week. I don't know what you're up to tomorrow. Are you at work, maybe? Um, Are you with a group of friends? Let's say you're at work. And you've got a meeting at some point this week with a few other people. Try this. When you go into the meeting, before the meeting starts, instead of being on your phone waiting for the meeting to stop, when you go into the room to the meeting, put your phone in your pocket and ask the people who you're about to have the meeting with, how how was your weekend? What did you do? And then at the end of the meeting, instead of getting your phone straight out again and having a look at it, keep your phone in your pocket and say, well, what are you up to the rest of the day? What's the rest of your week looking like? Connect. Be a connector. You you could do this with the people you live with if you live with people. I mean, each time you come in the front door, when you come in the front door, go, hi, I'm home. Even if no one's in. Because there may be somebody in, and you're connecting. You know, if I asked us, everyone here, to just stand up for a moment and to hold hands with each other, then you would feel pretty awkward. But I'm not asking you to connect like that. I'm just saying connect in a way that's you. And do that. Like a nod or a smile or a question or a hand. Connect. If you want to see more of the power of the Spirit, connect. Then there's share in prayer. If you want to experience more of the outpouring of the Spirit, because these group of people, these followers of Jesus, what did they do when they come together? It says that they prayed, and it says they were constantly in prayer. Literally, they were, they were busy in prayer. Something extraordinary happens when we get together and pray. 
a friend of ours, uh, again in Brighton, he, for a number of years, each Christmas time, a couple of weeks before Christmas in December, he's got together a group of his male friends, about seven of them, and they've had an evening together of good wine and drink and, and food. And they've done this, it's like become an annual thing, these eight friends get together before Christmas. This last year, the Christmas just gone, he got in touch and said, we're going to do it again, we're going to have an evening of good food and good drink, but this time we're going to just switch it up a little bit. This time, as part of the evening, we're going to go round at one point, and each of us is going to say one thing about 2018 that we're going to leave behind, and one thing that we want to pick up in 2019, and then we're going to pray. I mean, it's a very brave thing to do, because if you've got a set group of friends who are used to relating in one way to do that is a brave thing. I mean, it could have completely bombed and been so naff. But actually, it totally worked. And that friendship group was gone to a whole deeper level at the start of this year. Whenever we come together and we pray, whether it's in a connect group, but by the way, the connect group, the clue is in the name. Or whether it's, I mean, Kingdom Come on Tuesday, I think, is this amazing opportunity to come together and do this and see the power of the Spirit fall. Or whether it's a, whatever prayer gathering is, we, we, what we're doing is we're creating an environment for the Holy Spirit to be poured, poured out on us. And then the other way, if we want to see more of the Spirit and position ourselves to set ourselves up for more Spirit in us, is around purpose, or what I would call pursuing a purpose. Because there's nothing like having a common sense of vision and objective and purpose to connect us with one another and with God. And if you notice that people bond over all sorts of things, cricket and cars and photography and football and Fortnite. Here, here Jesus says to his followers, wait for the Holy Spirit, which you've heard me speak about, and you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power. And then he talks about the purpose. He says, then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is that God's power, his Holy Spirit does not just arrive in our lives, but it is pointed in our lives towards the purpose of our lives. It is given to us towards the purpose of our lives. There's a group of named individuals, he's saying, Peter and James and, was it Andrew and John? And they've got a really big purpose coming up in their lives. They're going to start a mission. They're going to care for the lost. They're going to see transformation and they're going to witness to Jesus to the ends of the earth. And what Jesus is saying to them is that you've got a big vision, but, 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 but don't even think about doing it until, first of all, you've decided that you're not going to do it on your own, but you're going to do it together. You, plural. And second, don't even think about it until you've already all been empowered to be able to do it by my Holy Spirit. And for me, for, for you, what, what's the purpose of your life that is so big that you couldn't contemplate doing it on your own? It can only be done together. Oh, what is the purpose of your life that cannot be accomplished unless you have the power of the Holy Spirit to help you get it done? My, my wife, Sam, has just come back from Hong Kong. Uh, each year, we take our interns from the church in Brighton for a two-week mission trip to Jackie Pullinger and her work in the walled city in Hong Kong. And, Jackie does some extraordinary work amongst drug addicts and the homeless and some of the most marginalized and desperate in that city. And Sam got to go on the trip at uh, this time. And she just got back. And one of the things that she said that she noticed was that with um, Jackie Pullinger and her team who are out there, when they're working amongst and praying for the homeless and the drug addicts and the people who are the most desperate in the margins of society, they often pray using the gift of tongues in a prayer language inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it got Sam thinking because she actually, Sam said, like, she has the gift of tongues, she said, but I, she said, I, I don't, to be honest, I don't use it very much. 
And she said to the people who were working there, she said, I noticed that when you're working and praying for the drug addicts and the marginalized and the desperate, why, why, why do you pray in tongues so much? And they said to her, you will use it when you have to. And it got Sam thinking because, you know, how many gifts of the Holy Spirit do we have latent in us? How much power and ability of the Spirit do we have available to us? But it's underused, it's not utilized because, well, you will use it when you have to. And are our lives and our purpose and our vision of our lives, are we pursuing something that is requiring an outpouring of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in order for us to be able to get it done? And so when I think about we have focus, what we talked about earlier in these few days away together in July, I think focus is a microcosm of everything we've just been talking about. I think that focus is Acts 1 and 2 in, in a bottle. I mean, it's an opportunity to connect. You know, sometimes when uh, we think about focus and you see the promo video, you think, goodness, all those people. I mean, masses of people. I don't want that. But focus isn't masses of people, actually. I mean, and, and don't buy a ticket just to make up the numbers. No, focus is a roll call of named individuals, like in Acts 1, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Bartholomew and all the rest. It, it's, it, it's, well, put simply, it won't be the same if you're not there. Somebody said to me that they make, it's like they make four years of friends, <laughs> in four days at Focus. It's an opportunity to connect. Someone else I know says that Focus is the, like the one time in the year when they don't feel they're doing life completely on their own. I would encourage us maybe when we're thinking about Focus, if I may, uh, to be brave. You know, those of us who are, maybe haven't been before and are thinking about well, shall I or shan't I go to be brave. Uh, we were all first timers once. Last I looked, we all survived it thrived on it. Actually, uh, Sam and I, our top tip for what it's worth for people who are thinking about coming for the first time to Focus is to come as part of the team. Sam and I, we've always been to Focus as part of the team to kind of make it happen, um, to help put the event on, whether it's with the kids or the youth or the media or the production or the setting up or setting down or whatever it is, because well, partly because, frankly, it's cheaper that way, <laughs> um, but also because... There's nothing like being on a team to like feel like, like you're boosted in being part of something. You make friends and connections easily when you're alongside people. But, but I think others of us who maybe have been to Focus before, I think, I think we could do with being brave as well. In other words, who is it that we could ask and invite along with us? Who could we say, look, I'll make it really easy for you to come for the first time because you can camp with me. Join with me. We'll do accommodation together. We'll do food together. We'll hang out together. We'll go to the same things together so that it, it, you don't feel like you're just coming on your own, but you're part already of the family. One of the things that I, I like most about um, focus is the, the community areas, like the, the St. Peter's Village or uh, the community area that there'll be for the Seven and Brompton Road. Because when I look around at the people in these pitches, the ones I know in St. Peter's, I see a whole mixture of people. Some people are, are young, some people are much older, some people have been Christians for a short time or long time or, or not at all. There's people who I know who are out of work or people who are in work, people who uh, are extrovert or introvert. But, but it's like a kind of heavenly family. It's like everybody's for each other. Everybody's helping each other, like, make it work. And it's, it's the most beautiful thing that when people get together, it's like, it's like something extraordinary happens when people choose to get together. Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't fill events, and the Holy Spirit doesn't fill institutions. The Holy Spirit does not fill programs or plans or policies. The Holy Spirit fills people, folks, like you and me. They happen, may happen to be at an event. Those people may happen to be part of an institution. They may be very good at programs or policies or plans. But our God is a relational, relatable God, and he fills John and Janet and Jason and Joanna when they choose to be together. The Holy Spirit is poured out. 
Then there's this thing here about, about praying. I think we see that at Focus as well. One of the things I've noticed is that in those few days at Focus, it seems to be for many people on an individual level, a kind of place of problem solving or a breakthrough in their personal lives, of personal vision. It, 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 um, it, it happens often in conversation around the fire pits or in the bar and the walled garden or in a time of prayer ministry or eating together. It, it reminds me of the story of Jesus and the healing of the paralyzed man. The four friends bring this friend of theirs to Jesus to be healed. And Jesus cures the man and he's able to do it, he says, partly because of the faith of the friends of this man. And I think focus is a little bit like, it's like we're, we're bringing each other to Jesus to heal us, to help us, to reset us. But it's like we help each other in the process, sharing in, in praying. It's, 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 it's like something extraordinary happens when we get together. And then there's the thing about purpose. Because I love the conversation uh, that Jesus has here at the beginning of the story with his followers in Acts chapter 1. Because they, they say to Jesus, are, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, what they're saying is a little bit egocentric. It's in it for them. And a bit small-minded. And Jesus replies to them in a way that blows their expectations completely out of the water. He says, well, yeah, there is some... Um, Jerusalem, sure, you're right, Israel. But also, have you considered Judea and Samaria and ever thought about the ends of the earth that you could be my witnesses in when my spirit is poured out? In other words, he has a purpose and a vision for them that is far beyond just themselves and their own imagination. Uh, when I think about focus, I think that very often we start by thinking about focus on ourselves. You know, what, will I like it? Um, who will I share with? Will I make friends? Is it my kind of thing? Is it value for money? Can I afford the time off work? Is it, what's in it for me? And actually, all those questions are good. They, 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 they need to be answers, I think, for all those questions. But supposing God wants to do something in your life this summer at Focus that is beyond you and your present imagination. Because in, in life, don't just be yourself. <laughs> in life, don't just be you. Sometimes it's our fixation on ourselves that makes it harder for us actually to connect. Don't, don't be you. Um, be, be us. Be we. Be part of the group. Make the group worth it. Take your little life and join it in with the wider life of God and his people. And there's something about focus, I think, that shifts our mindset from being egocentric to expansive. That the Spirit is poured out on us there on those few days in the new forest, but not for our own personal experience but also for our empowerment. For like it says here, that we may be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And there's something that focus that shifts us <coughs> from being this event for, what, 7,000 people from a bunch of churches across the HTB network, across the country, and fingers crossed it doesn't rain, to being actually not really about an event at all for however many thousands of people. But actually, it shifts us from being towards a movement that is not so much about the people who are at the event, but the tens of thousands of people who live in the cities of the churches who are represented at the event because the Holy Spirit has inspired something out of this church, HTB, of planting and cities right up and down the country in ways that we would never have imagined even two or three years ago. I mean, were you there two years ago 
at Focus. When we prayed and sent out Coventry and Derby and the church plant to Crawley. Were you there last year when we heard about Southampton and Bristol and Andover? Did you hear the stories of the lives being changed in Plymouth and in Portsmouth and Hastings and the lives being changed through HTB because we were at Focus? Focus isn't just an event. It's a, it's a movement of something extraordinary that happens when people get together. Together. That word together is a, is a favorite word of Luke who writes this story in Acts. Homophomadon is the original word that he writes, and he loves that word. It comes again and again in his gospel, Luke, and also in Acts. Actually, together is translated, it's almost too weak. It's a stronger word than that. It literally means of one heart and mind. And this is the word that Luke is continually driving at in the early church and the outpouring of the Spirit. Can you imagine what might happen this summer at Focus? In this nation at this particular time that seems so particularly divided right now, between north and south and rich and poor and haves and have-nots and remainers and leavers, can you imagine what might happen if a group of people inspired by the Holy Spirit through all these church plants that are coming, shooting out of this place, HTB, right across the up and down the country, come together of one heart and mind, together of one heart and mind, choosing to be together and the Holy Spirit gets poured out on us. Something extraordinary happens when we get together. Amen.